Well, good morning, church. It is great to be with you. My name's Ethan. I'm one of the ministers here. If we haven't met yet, I am glad you're here today. Uh, welcome. We've got a lot of college students, ETSU, Milligan, Northeast State, all over the place, rolling back in. Welcome back to our college students. If you're here uh, today, you're in the right place. Glad you're here with us. Uh, before I jump in uh, to the message today, i got a couple things I want to let you know about. Uh, first, I want to let you know about the next sermon series we have coming up in two weeks. Uh, it's called Weeds in My Garden, and we're going to be uh, bringing some biblical hope and some biblical um, really gospel, some good news uh, in the area of mental health. Um, and, and this sermon series, uh, uh, really probably two years ago, I had friends of mine in ministry all over the country start texting me and like, hey, listen, man, have you watched this sermon series or have you done this sermon series? We just did it at my church. It was amazing. Uh, you should check this out. And um, honestly, I was already planned ahead and didn't really pay much attention to it, but more and more people. And so I finally did pay attention to it. Uh, and I really think it's going to be a great, great experience. Um, we're just going to be thinking about how there really is hope hope in God and in Christ for all of us who are on a journey with mental health. So you know I am, and I've talked about that some, and a lot of us are. And um, so it's going to be a great series. You may want to invite people to this series. That starts in two weeks. Uh, so be, be paying attention to that. Uh, the other thing I, I want to do uh, before uh, we get going here, I need some help with. Uh, Mike, are you still around? Oh, yeah. Here's Mike and Bowden. Uh, thank you, Mike. I need Mike's help here. All right. Good. Yeah. Welcome, Mike. Um, while he's coming out, we got some pictures up on the screen there. Uh, you can check those out. I think we got some pictures here. Oh, that's good. Uh, that's good. Yeah, oh, those are good pictures. Yeah. Um, and if you find yourself wondering how long ago were those pictures taken? With hair. With hair, yes. Uh, the answer to how long ago those pictures were taken is 40 years. That's how long ago those were taken. And the reason that's significant, and we waited a couple weeks, because I don't want people to be gone on vacation, but um, in 1st of August, uh, Mike passed a milestone of 40 years of continuous, uninterrupted service to this church. That's amazing. Um, that is, uh, uh, that's incredible. Um, he outlasted Ralph Sins, Don Jeans, Mike Shannon, Tim Wallingford. I plan to be here a long time. I expect he'll outlast me. Um, he has done so much good work. Uh, he's led choirs, kids' choirs, adult choirs, led worship. Uh, he was working here while he was also working in the school system. Uh, just amazing contribution to our church. Now, of course, Mike leads our top two generation uh, ministry, which is amazing. They do such incredible events, and they usually invite the rest of us. We got the, we're doing the jazz thing again this Christmas, aren't we? Yep. All right, we'll have Christmas jazz again and lots more. It'll be stuff before that. Um, and I really, we, we've got a gift for you that I'll give you sometime. Um, but, I, but a lot of you, uh, I don't have it with me today, you know, I, you know, whatever. it'd be a prop, you know, he'll get a third <laughs> service, you know. Um, but I, I will say a lot of you have been blessed by Mike's ministry. And I would say if you're looking uh, out, you know, when would be a good time to write a thank you note uh, to Mike and Bowden? I think 40 years would be a pretty good time, right? So um, if you, if you want to take, ta don't forget, uh, this is an amazing milestone uh, Mike, I'm so grateful. Um, when I got here, I already knew. I already knew you. We'd, we'd bumped into each other, you know, um, in ministry over the years. Uh, but I was so thrilled. And I love working with you. Uh, can you thank Mike again one more time? 40 years. That's amazing. Hey, love you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, again, most of y'all already know how awesome Mike is and his amazing contribution to our church. Um, uh, I will say one of the reasons I love working with Mike and did just from the second I showed up is actually related uh, to the series we're in right now. Because Mike understands that the church is part of a mission. That the church is not static. We are not just sitting around twiddling our thumbs and trying to entertain ourselves. That we are part of something bigger. And that's the series we're in right now. God has a mission God's mission has a church that the church belongs to. We are a possession of the outworking mission of God. We're a couple weeks in, so let me catch you up. First week, we said, what is God's mission? And it was bigger than we could cover in one week, but we summarized it using these four ideas. God's mission is rescue. 
God's mission is repair, God's mission is reign, and God's mission is rejoicing. And then last week, we observed that the Bible repeatedly says that Jesus is the one that is accomplishing God's mission. And the logic went like this. If God has a mission and Jesus is accomplishing it, and Jesus is the head of the church, which is his body, then that means God's mission has a church. The one who is accomplishing the mission of God, Jesus, is the head of the church, which is his body. And so as a church, we don't get to pick our mission. We don't get to decide what our mission is going to be. We don't get to decide whether we want to have a mission or don't want to have a mission. Our mission as a church must be God's mission. Uh, Rescue, repair, reign, rejoice. That's our mission. And and today we're going to talk about one of the miracles of God's goodness. Um, And that is this. As individuals, we not only are recipients of the mission of God. We are recipients of God's rescue. We are recipients of God's healing work. We are recipients of God's sovereignty. We also get to be participants in the mission of God. We get to be participants in the rescue, participants in the repair, the rain, the rejoicing. You get to be part of it. You have a role to play in the rescuing mission of God. You have a responsibility to the repairing work of God. You're you're a witness to the righteousness of God's reign. And you, if you let yourself, you could be right in the middle of the rejoicing. The amazing thing about how God heals us and rescues us and repairs us, it's like if you you got rushed to the hospital one day. At the edge of death, you're you're taken through the emergency room and and they do all the work. And by the time you leave, you're a nurse practitioner. It's not enough, you see, that God heals us and saves us. He then sends us out the door equipped to help others. It's like, yeah, your blood pressure is good, but, but you, you haven't learned enough CPR yet. We're not going to let you out the door until you know how to save somebody else. This is what our God does. So the mission of God, rescue, repair, reign, rejoice, that's this church's mission. And that gets to be your mission. And so for the next two weeks, we're going to talk about it. We're going to turn these into questions. Uh, today's questions are pretty simple. What is your role in the rescue? If God's mission now becomes our mission, what is your role in the rescue? And what is your responsibility in the repair? Uh, To help you picture that first question, uh, think with me a bit about lifeguards at the beach. I don't know if we all go to the beach, but I bet a bunch of us have been to the beach. And you've, you've seen the lifeguards up in their little stands, you know, watching people. I, I was a lifeguard uh, for a while, uh, probably eight years, worked as a lifeguard. I was a mediocre swimmer in high school and college. And that's what mediocre swimmers do in the summer is we become lifeguards. Good swimmers are obviously busy swimming. But mediocre swimmers, we, we work as lifeguards. And so that's what I did uh, throughout high school and, and, and college. And, and, and honestly, being a pool lifeguard is a pretty boring job. Mostly what you do is you test the chlorine levels and you yell at little kids for running uh, on the side of the pool. And you, you can work a long time as a pool lifeguard and never pull anybody out of the water or do anything like that, you know, bandage a few scraped knees. Uh, in fact, eight years as a lifeguard, I only actually pulled two people out of the water. And both times I was not on duty as a lifeguard. I was actually at Laurel Fork Falls both times. And some fool went in the water swimming in jeans and got caught in the current and sucked under and I had to pull them out. Those are the only two rescues in my whole lifeguarding uh, career. But that's very different than beach lifeguards. You know, that's a whole different animal, you know. I never was a beach lifeguard, but I remember as a little kid, we'd go to the beach every summer for about 15 straight years. I thought the lifeguards were the coolest people on the planet, right? And the rule was when I was in elementary school that my brother and I, we could only get into the water up to our ankles until the lifeguards got there. Right? And, and so we would get there every morning. We got down to the beach, crack of dawn, watch the sunrise, and then we would anxiously await the arrivals 
of the lifeguards. And it was the worst, right? Because they would get there and you're like, oh, they're here. But first they got to go swim a little bit. And then they jog for a while. Then they got to drag that stand down to the edge of the water. And then they get up that little chalkboard, you know, where they write high tide, low tide. I didn't care where the tide was. I wanted to get in the water. You know, they go, they go put the flags, they put one about 100 feet one side of the stand, and they put another about 100 feet the other side of the stand, those flags out. And then finally, they climb up there, and they blow the whistle, and we would run out into the waves, me and my brother. In that image of a lifeguard at the beach, in the middle of that image is your role in the rescuing work of God, right there in the middle of that image. Uh, Now, to be clear, it's not the lifeguard, okay? That's not you. You're not the one who does the rescue. Uh, The lifeguard is Jesus. Uh, The the apostles had to remind people of this all the time as they were doing the work of God to rescue. People got pretty impressed with him. Acts 4, Peter this one time says, rulers, elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame, and we're being asked how he was healed, Well, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and they realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, but they remembered one thing. Oh, right. They were with Jesus. So, no, we are not the lifeguards in that picture. We are not the ones who pull people from the water as it gets over their head, rescuing them from the brink of death. But we are in that picture. I think we're... The flags. That's who we are. You know what the flags do, right? The flags make sure everybody knows where the place of safety is. And where the place of risk is. On a windy day, the flags are all waving back and forth like this. So that everybody will know. There's a place where it is dangerous to swim. And there's a place where you will be rescued. They're up on poles. They they stick up high so you can see them, whether you're down in the water or up on the beach, so that people won't get confused. Because there is a place where it is dangerous to swim. And a place where it is safe. And don't get me wrong, as you approach the beach and you see everybody kind of bunched up in between the flags, I mean, you might decide. I myself have made this choice many times. I'm a good swimmer. I don't need rescuing. I understand the ocean and the waves. I'll swim here under my own strength and my own power. But the flag was there so that I would know that there was a place where rescue was possible and there was a place where I was under my own strength. Sink or swim. In fact, the only place, only time I remember actually being rescued by a lifeguard was when I actually was swimming well beyond the flags. Because I didn't want to be where it was crowded. I was trying to swim on my own. And a lifeguard swam out to me. I was way out in the water. And he said, listen, man, I can't make you. You can do what you want to do. But I just need you to know the tide's going out. And where you're swimming right now is about to be bare rock. There's a granite jetty that you can't see. And any minute now, you're going to ride one of these waves and you are going to hit solid stone. So you just do what you want to do. And he swam back. And at a rare moment of humility, I decided to trust him. And I followed him back. And he was right. The tide was moving fast. 20 minutes later, I would have just ridden a wave right into a big pile of rocks. We're the flags. That's who we are. We testify, we announce where the rescue is. Acts chapter 1, 
This is after Jesus' resurrection, near the very end of his time on earth. He gathers his disciples together. They say to him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to do the rescue thing right now, Lord? And he says, listen, it's not for you to know the times, the dates. The Father is set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. We talk a lot to make sure we know what that word witness means, right? A witness is just someone who has seen something and then tells others about it. That's what a witness does. I remember... This was like six years ago. I was at the beach, and I was sitting just past the flags uh, because I wanted a little more room. But I was swimming where the flags were. But I was sitting there at the beach. I was reading a book because I've entered my old man beach phase, and that's what I do at the beach now is read books. But anyways, I was reading a book at the beach, and I saw this family show up. And you could just tell by the way they were doing what they were doing, they hadn't been to the beach before. Like, this was a new experience. They were all, you know, slack-jawed from the majesty of the ocean and you could just tell they weren't great swimmers they didn't know how waves work like this was going to be quite an experience for them and they sat up next to me and they started walking down into the water and I just called out to them and I said hey you might know this but just in case you don't you need to know you see that flag right there that flag means that on the other side of the flag the lifeguard's paying attention and on this side of the flag he's not and No offense, but you sort of look like the kind of people who really, really want the lifeguard paying attention to you. Like, I think you're going to meet the lifeguard today, okay? That's all I'm saying. I wasn't quite that blunt about it. But I did. I did interrupt him. And I said, you need to know, I have seen with my eyes, I can bear witness to what happens when a weak swimmer who doesn't understand waves, what happens when they walk in the ocean? They get knocked down and turned over. And they need somebody to run in the water and stand them up and say, it's only three inches deep, stand up, you're fine, you know. That's, that's, that's our role in the rescue. We're just a little flappy flag saying that's, that's where rescue is and that's where danger is. Jesus says, you'll be my witnesses. Paul says much the same thing. When he writes to the Corinthian church, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. We once thought about Christ in this way, but no longer. For if anyone is Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself. That's this rescuing work of God. And how did God do it? Through Christ Jesus. We talked about this last week. And then gave us. Look at that. Just as soon as God rescues us, God gives us a role in the work of rescue. We walk in the hospital, an ER patient. We leave the hospital, an EMT. It's just boom, boom. Gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against him. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Around here at FCC, we talk about who we are using these four things we call the DNA of FCC. And the fourth part of our DNA is this. We tell our story as missionaries. And if you've been kicking around here and you're like, maybe I wonder what's going on with that church. This is what's going on with that church. This is who we are. We are committed to doing our part and taking, accepting our responsibility in God's mission. What is our role in the rescue? We tell our story. That's what we do. We just say, I've seen salvation. I've experienced forgiveness. Uh, my marriage got saved. I found friendships. I was lonely. Now I'm not. Whatever your testimony of God's goodness to you through Jesus is, that is your role in the rescue. We are not the Savior, we are witnesses. 
We are not the king. We are ambassadors. We are not the lifeguards. That's somebody else's job. Those people would get up four in the morning and run five miles. I have no interest in that. We are not the lifeguards. We are the flags. Just flapping around. I saw somebody once get out so far they couldn't swim back. But a lifeguard went out and got them. I saw somebody once, they were too little. They got knocked down by a wave and couldn't get up. But a lifeguard went up and got them. I saw a full family of four people. They go out on a little raft. The raft popped. The air went out. None of them knew how to swim. And a lifeguard went out and got them. That's our job, just to tell the story of rescue that we have witnessed. I'm going to get crazy practical with you. Because what I believe is if we have clarity about our role in the rescue, we have a chance of actually doing it. So let me be really clear. Part of your role in the rescue is if you believe that you know a place where good news is preached on a Sunday morning, part of your role is to bring somebody with you to hear good news. Just tell them that. Say, hey, listen, it fills me up every week. If you ever need a fill up, you should come with me. It's awesome. You'll have, you'll have more hope when you walk out when you walk in. That's all I know. Uh, maybe you're part of a, a, a small group or a Bible study or a Sunday school class where you've found friendship and hope and family, where you're studying God's word and learning about the love of God, and you're having this positive experience. Wave your arms. I know where rescue is. It's on this side of me. Come with me over here. Don't wander over there. That's, that's the whole thing. Don't try to be somebody's lifeguard. Jesus has got that covered. Try to be their flag that they can see from where they are so they'll know where the place of rescue is. You can, maybe, maybe it's this next series on mental health. Everybody, everybody you know would like their mental health to be stronger. I bet if you're paying attention, you'll have a conversation in the next two weeks where mental health comes up. People talk about it constantly right now. Be ready when it comes up. Just say, you know, they're going to be talking about my church in two weeks. It might be lame. My preacher's hit or miss, but it could be awesome. <laughs> you, you, should, you should come. It could be awesome. You should come check it out. That's, all, that's, that's your role in the rescue. All right, we had two questions. Number one, what's your role in the rescue? That's your role right here. You're just the flag. I know where the rescue is. Second question, what is your responsibility in the repair. Now, of course, our initial observation still applies here. We are not the ones who will fix everything. That's Jesus' job. Jesus is the one who says, behold, I will make there be a new heaven and a new earth. The old order of things will, will be forgotten. I will replace mourning with laughter. I will, of course, crying with gladness. Jesus is the one who does that. But you've got a role. You have a responsibility to the repairing work of God. It starts with what Jesus called uh, the greatest commandment. You know, Jesus was tricky. Whenever they would ask him what the greatest commandment was, he would always respond with two. Tricky guy, I know. They would say, ask for one. He'd always give him two. Every time. What's the greatest commandment? He would always say, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And, and then he would go on, he would, he would not just talk about loving your neighbor, he would talk about loving your enemy, loving the stranger, loving the foreigner, loving the hungry. He even said you should love rich people. Who knew? He says you should love the one who persecutes you. You should love your family. Just for shorthand, it might be easier just to say love everyone. That's what my t-shirt says, love everyone. That's what Jesus says. People would ask him about that, this whole love your neighbor thing, because it does sound a little crazy, right? People would want to know, who exactly is my neighbor? How exactly should I love them? He was getting quizzed this one time, and in response, he told a story. He said, there was a man going from Jerusalem to Jericho, and along the way, he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, and they beat him, and they went away, and they left him half dead. And a priest saw the man 
who happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Uh, So too, a Levite, when he came to the place, he saw the man, and he passed by on the other side. But then a Samaritan, and and you need to know, Samaritans were were a group of foreigners that the Jews pretty much hated. It was pretty bad. It's pretty bad. And Jesus picks this guy to kind of make the story as intense as possible. He says, a Samaritan, as he traveled, he came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He put the man on his donkey. He took him to an inn. He took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the robbers? It's not really that hard a question, is it? The expert in the law got it. He says, oh, well, it was the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and... Do that same thing. Just, just do that. Just have mercy on the people you walk by. And then later in Jesus' life, after he was pretty much done telling stories, it was actually just a couple days before he would be killed, he gathered with his disciples for a meal. John 13 describes how that meal gets started. It says, It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The meal was in progress. The devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew, Jesus knew, That the Father had put all things under his power. Imagine that moment of realization. Where you come to the realization that all things are under your power. you got to do something with all that power. He knew he'd come from God. He knew he was returning to God. And he's got all this power. And so he gets up from the meal. And he takes off his outer robes and he wraps a towel around his waist. He pours some water into a bowl and he begins to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he's wearing. There's some controversy about this, but if you go down to verse 12, it says, when he'd finished washing their feet, He got dressed again, went and sat down again. And he says, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord. And you got it right. That's that's what I am. In fact, I recently became aware that all the power in the universe is mine. So there you go, a little update. I have all the power in the universe. Now that I... Your Lord and teacher have washed your feet. You should also wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you so that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. See, he's the master. And we're the servants. He says, you're not better than me. He's the king who sends us, and we're the messengers. He says, you're not better than me. And I washed feet. Now that you understand these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. I went looking for a symbol to help us understand our responsibility in the repair. And I don't know a better symbol than a basin and a towel. 
Jesus says, now that I've done these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. What is our responsibility in the repair? It's to get off our donkey and help the person on the side of the road. To pick up a bowl and a towel and wash the feet of those around us. If you ever have a moment where you discover you have more power than you thought you did. Jesus had a moment like that. The Bible says he suddenly knew that he had all the power in the universe. If you ever have a moment where you discover, I have more power than I thought I did. This is why. This is what that power is for. Uh, I own a, a fancy pottery thing that's meant to be a basin and a, a fancy linen towel to use as a prop. But that's actually not what these are. Um, this is a bowl I just grabbed out of one of our cabinets on the way out the door. And, and this I actually pulled out of the hamper. It's a slightly dirty uh, dishcloth. Um, <laughs> please don't tell my wife um, uh, that I grabbed a dirty dishcloth out of our hamper. Um, um, that's, the basin and a towel aren't meant to be fancy images. It's stuff you, everybody owns a bowl, you know, and you probably own a towel. You, you're welcome to use a clean one. That probably would be preferred. But, uh, you know, we're, we're in the middle of this thing called Cannonball. One of our Cannonball projects is to make progress getting to where we, we, we feel God's calling us in how we care for our hungry and unhoused neighbors. And, um, and we're making a lot of progress. We've talked pretty openly that we're stuck. We, have, we haven't finished the work of finding a location uh, because our real vision for this is to share a meal around the table. Passing out food is, is good, but it does not build the kind of relationship that really leads to healing and next step and a bridge um, toward wholeness and recovery. And so we we're, we're really feel like we're, we're grateful for what God's allowing us to do today, but we feel called to something more. And, and maybe you want to know why. Like, why are we spending so much energy and we're asking you to pray about this and we're ready to invest money in it? Um, well, it's because we love our neighbors. We love our hungry neighbors. We love our neighbors who have no place to live. And in our love for them, we want to serve them and get to know them and learn their names, become friends with them, let them love and serve us. That's, that's why. This is the mission of the church. This is, this is who we, it's our little part in the repair uh, next month, we got Love JC coming up, right? Skyland talked about Love JC, right? We got a slide up for that. Love JC. Um, why do we do Love JC? And, and just to be clear, what, what do we hope for Love JC? It's always weird. We really are hoping that 300 ish people from this church do it. Like, we need a lot of people to do it. We have committed uh, to dozens and dozens of projects to really try to have a high impact day of service in our city. And so we need hundreds of people to do it. So, like, if you're already busy on September 21st, I get it. But if you haven't made your plans yet, I hope these are your plans. These are my plans. We need hundreds and hundreds of us to jump on board to get done all we're hoping to do uh, in this. We, we're, we're moving men's breakfast. If you're wondering, wait, isn't that men's breakfast? It is. We're going to move men's breakfast up a half hour so that we can eat our breakfast and still make it uh, to love JC. And again, why? Well, because this is our mission. Our mission is to repair what we can in the name of Jesus um, and trust Jesus to repair the rest. That, that's the mission. Um, I will say, Love JC, it's coming up fast. It's September 21st, but you have to sign up so that we can get everything organized and have the equipment all ready. You have to sign up by September 1st. So don't sit on this one. Just like look at your calendar. As soon as service is over, make a plan, sign up, get registered. Um, do love JC. If you're going to be part of the mission of God, you need to be clear on what your role is. So let's jump back to our two questions. What is your role in the rescue? And what is your responsibility 
in the repair. What is your role in the rescue? This is your role. To flap in the wind. Over here. I know where the rescue is. I saw it with my own eyes. I experienced it in my own life. It's over here. That's the whole thing. Just testify. Just be a witness. They can ignore you and swim where they want. But you will have done your part to participate in the rescuing work of Jesus. What is your responsibility in the repair? It's right here. Find the bowl and towel you've been given. Recognize, like Jesus, the power you have. I know he had all the power in the universe. You have less power than that. But you've got more power than you think. What's the power you do have? And ask God, how could I do that to fix just a little corner? Maybe you've got a free Saturday. That's a place to start. That's a piece of power. I've got a free Saturday and an able body. Great. Use it for Jesus on September 21st. When you have clarity on your role and clarity on your responsibility, you understand that the mission of God is the mission of the church and is your mission as well. And you are lucky enough to not only be a recipient of God's mission, but a participant in it, enabled by God's grace to bring rescue, repair, reign and rejoicing into a world that so desperately needs it. Let me pray for you. God, I find myself filled with joy that I, that we could be recipients of the rescuing work of God. Oh God, I need rescuing. God, we are so grateful that you are busy healing and repairing us. Oh God, we need to be repaired and healed and made whole. God, we thank you that you still reign and seek to reign over our lives. God, we surrender to you. Be sovereign over our steps. And God, we thank you that we get to rejoice in the hope we have in Jesus. Rejoicing like we've already done today. Thank you, God. And then, God, as we recognize how your mission is blessing us and working through us, would you galvanize our hearts to become a part of the mission? To accept our role as witnesses to the rescue, telling our story of your faithfulness and mercy. To accept our role as servants to our neighbors and our enemies and our family and our friends and strangers and foreigners, servants loving everyone. This is the role you've given us. I pray, God, I want to be real specific. I pray that our acceptance of that would not be theoretical, but it would be specific. We would know who we're going to witness and know how we're going to serve. And then we would follow through and do it in Jesus' name and for your glory. Accomplish this work of grace in our lives, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.